Well, welcome to section seven um, of this course on international human rights, in which we will study the role of domestic authorities, national authorities, in the protection of human rights. Um, this is a very important topic, and it's important for a few reasons. The first one of which is very simply that um, in international human rights law, it is at the domestic level first and foremost that um, rights, human rights, can be effectively protected. The international um, mechanisms that uh, ensure the protection of human rights, of course, in some cases are quite robust. And we'll see in Section 8 that we have, for example, at regional level, international courts that are um, established to protect human rights, whose judgments are um, well uh, respected, complied with, and enforced uh, by the states to whom they are addressed. Um, but we should not forget one major weakness of uh, enforcement of international human rights uh, at international level, and that is that human rights treaties, as we have seen, are not like commercial or investment treaties that are concluded um, as an exchange of advantages between states. Human rights treaties are not like that. Human rights treaties are promises that states um, make uh, to the populations under their, their jurisdiction. There are commitments that states take um, towards the people over whom they exercise control. They are not concluded as um, an exchange of advantages, of interests between the states concerned. And so there's little incentive for, for states to control each other. There is uh, little that can be expected from the horizontal enforcement, if you wish, of of international human rights law, um, which is normally how international law gets enforced, is by states reacting to another state committing a violation, by adopting countermeasures, by um, expressing its, its, its discontent. This does not work um, as effectively as it should uh, as regards um, human rights treaties. So um, uh, domestic enforcement of human rights is, is, is extremely important. It's also um, important for another reason. Um, which is that there is a, a relationship that is very interesting to, to analyze and to understand between the right of individuals to an effective remedy in order to complain about the human rights violation that they believe they have been a victim of, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the duty for the individual to uh, use the local remedies available before filing a complaint, before filing a communication, an application at international level. Most uh, uh, procedures that are established at international level, allowing to engage the responsibility of the state before an international court or an expert body, require that the victim first exhaust the local remedies available, the remedies available in the domestic legal order. And that corresponds indeed also to a right of the individual to have access to effective remedies, um, remedies that can um, uh, allow the individual to obtain um, a cessation of the violation or to be compensated for the violation that has taken place. So it is uh, a duty for the individual to use these remedies before attacking the state on the international plane, but it is in the interest of the state at the same time to provide the, individu the individual with effective remedies at domestic level in order not to be accused at international level before being given a chance really to to remedy the situation and to provide reparation to the um, to the individual aggrieved so um, this interaction between the right to an effective remedy on the one hand and the duty to exhaust the local remedies available on the other hand is one topic that we will discuss um, in this in this section um, of course, it is before domestic courts that um, most often human rights violations will be, um, will be um, claimed and that reparation will be sought. But at the same time, it's important uh, to realize that courts um, cannot always um, act um, with the effectiveness required in order to um, address human rights violations. In most cases, they are able to um, order a cessation of the violation, they are able to provide reparation to victims of human rights violations, but there are some limitations to what courts may do. First of all, it's important to note that um, some human rights violations are widespread, uh, um, affect a large number of individuals, 
And as a result, it may well be the case that no single individual will, will be willing to file a claim to denounce this violation, because after all, if many other people are equally affected by the violation in question, why would this one individual accept the burden of litigating a case, accept the costs and, and, and um, time um, um, imposed on the individual to, to file a, a claim against a particular situation, if many other individuals would be um, equally in a position to file that, that claim. So, paradoxically, some human rights violations could remain unaddressed, unpunished, um, precisely because they are widespread and because there is no clear answer to this collective action problem that arises. Uh, secondly, um, of course, courts may um, intervene uh, post hoc once a violation has taken place to uh, order a cessation of the violation if it's continuing or to um, provide compensation to the to the victim but courts are not particularly well suited to prevent future um, human rights violations from from occurring um, uh, usually they can only be um, um, competent when the violation has already taken place um, um, and moreover they are not usually well equipped to transform um, in a more structural or systematic fashion the um, uh, uh, the 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 state or the or the institution that has been responsible for the um, human rights violation in the first place. Um, there are many limitations to what courts may achieve as um, uh, agents, if you wish, of social change that can bring about the structural transformations required for the risk of human rights violations to be um, eliminated or reduced um, in the future. So, for this reason, uh, for these reasons, really. Uh, there are limitations to what courts may achieve and in this section we will also look at other non-judicial mechanisms that can be established at domestic level to prevent human rights violations and to improve um, how human rights are protected at the domestic level. Now these mechanisms are diverse. We have for example parliamentary committees who can um, screen the legislation that is proposed uh, to them for adoption to assess whether that legislation is compatible with um, the requirements of human rights. They can perform human rights impact assessments to that effect. We also have, um, since um, about 20 years now, a very significant development uh, that results from the establishment in many countries of national human rights institutions, um, also called national institutions for the promotion and protection of human rights. Now, these are institutions that are independent from government that um, are um, tasked with um, preparing recommendations addressed to government or to parliament as to how human rights could be better protected at domestic level. And there are institutions that usually are pluralistic in their composition or that at least in their working methods shall um, work together with civil society organizations, uh, trade unions, churches, academics, in order to um, um, provide recommendations, um, adopt reports um, that will be as well informed as possible by the various sensitivities present in the, in the society um, concerned. National human rights institutions have been developing um, significantly over the past 20 years after um, a set of principles were adopted that describe their role, their mandate, and also the working methods that they should, in principle, adopt. And these principles are called the Paris Principles. They were initially adopted in 1991 at a meeting convened in Paris by the French National um, Advisory Commission on Human Rights, the French uh, Commission Nationale Consultative des Droits de l'Homme, which was the first ever national human rights institution established back in 1947. And these Paris Principles were adopted then by the Commission on Human Rights at the time and then by the United Nations General Assembly in a resolution of 20th of December 1993. So these principles define the functions, um, methods of work and composition of national human rights institutions and they have been proliferating in recent years um, 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 in, in many countries, particularly in the global south. Um, so we'll um, end up uh, with a discussion of these national human rights institutions, these 
non-judicial mechanisms that complement the role of domestic courts in um, protecting human rights at domestic level. I wish you um, uh, good work and I look forward to our um, week of exchanges on these topics with you.